Finance. Wow, what a ridiculously amazing intro. Uh, welcome everyone to the first episode of the Mad Scientist Financial Independence Podcast. Uh, I'm thrilled to introduce my guest today. Uh, he was able to retire in his early 30s and is now one of the most entertaining and informative personal finance writers around. It's only been just over a year since he started his blog, MrMoneyMustache.com, but his popularity has exploded and continues to grow with each intelligent and hilarious article he writes. So without further delay, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Mr. Money Mustache. Thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot, Mad Scientist. It's good to be here. <laughs> thanks. So uh, for those uh, that don't know your story, could you uh, just take us back to the start? Uh, you know, how did you get on this journey to financial independence? Yeah, well, the thing about the story is it's not really all that amazing. In fact, it seemed pretty normal to me. So, uh, and that's kind of what led to the blog is I did something that I felt was fairly normal. And then I ended up at a sort of a semi-retirement shortly after age 30. And then I looked around and nobody else was even close to retired. And so that's what compelled me to feel like I had to start writing about it. But if you go back before that, how it started, I think I got a relatively early start to saving up some cash and getting to financial independence. But, you know, I had slip ups along the way and I wasn't particularly hardcore. But a few things that did speed me up were that I started pretty young, like in high school. You know, my parents made it clear to me that I need to pay for most of my own education. So I had jobs starting around age 15, working in the gas station, the convenience store, the hardware store and all, all those years I saved up towards college, the understanding was like, when you get these part-time jobs, you're not just buying a car with it or just drinking it away. You have to uh, save most of it. So I probably saved up maybe 10 grand towards college tuition back in high school. But even then there was room for, there was room for spending too. You know, I had a motorcycle back then and a nice stereo and a girlfriend. And I thought I was leading a normal high school life. So then in college, I think that's where the real difference happened because I just got a good job every summer making 12 to 15 bucks an hour and I would save that for the next year's tuition. But I noticed a lot of my coworkers or not coworkers, I guess it was my co-students. They were they had stuff that I thought was amazing, you know, like they had laptop computers and back then that was pretty an amazing thing, expensive thing to have. They had cars, they had like their own dedicated $600 a month apartments whereas I was just living with my family. So, it's just a real a difference in, you know, my goal was spend no more than what I earn and other people, for other people, borrowing was an option. So it's really just the foundation of, of not living beyond your means. And I, I think I didn't even know that you could get loans back then. Or if I did, I, I thought, you know, why would you get one alone? That's kind of scary. Right. Yeah. And then, and that's interesting when you said that you didn't even realize that this was eventually your goal. You were just living this lifestyle and, and it just came easy. And, and as you discuss a lot in your blog, you know, this isn't rocket science and it isn't, you know, impossible for, you know, average earners. And you, you've demonstrated that you can still live a really good life with, you know, without all of the stuff that all the other people are buying. And now you're retired and living an even better life. Um, so that that's just, yeah, that's incredible. Um, as you As you amass this amount of savings, did you ever... When did it click that you're like, hey, wait a second, I could actually stop working soon? Yeah, well, that took a while because at first, you know, like once I graduated as an engineer, I got a job, so the pay was better. You know, I was making like $40,000 when I first graduated, and that eventually went up to just over a hundred grand over the next five years. And I just kept spending at the normal level of what a typical person who makes 30 to 40 grand might spend. Um, so eventually, you know, my goal was just to make as much as possible. And I kind of figured I don't want to waste money, but I'll just spend on whatever I want. So we still did travel and everything else. And, but then the money just started building up. So I think I just read books on investing and, you know, I kind of I started thinking, okay, what do you do when you have extra money and you don't want to spend it? And so then the idea of um, getting more serious about understanding investments um, gradually formed itself in my mind. And and then I finally, I didn't have a, like an epiphany moment, but I just realized that, you know, money makes money for you. So your real goal is just to have enough money that it continually makes money so that you don't have to work anymore. So that was probably about, I don't know, like five years into my career. And I had, 
you know, savings growing. And then I thought, well, let's just go the rest of the way and get these savings up to a big enough level where we can quit. And it was also, by that time, I'd just recently gotten married. So my wife and I were thinking of starting a family at some point, And we always kind of wanted to have uh, the type of not the busy kind of lifestyle that we saw other people with kids have where you're just like shuttling your kid around and you're always busy. We wanted to be just home with the kid, you know, like free to do whatever you want. You can spend home, spend days at home with them or you can go out on trips with them. And, you know, there's no no kind of mandatory office shifts mixed in with this already difficult thing of having a baby or a young child around the house. So it was like... That's the one thing when reading your your blog that I I really you pick up on is just how lucky your child is to to have both parents at home and you know you see all these parents you know buying you know three different types of strollers for all different terrain and things like that and but then they have to work 40 hours 60 hours a week and um it really yeah it really comes out in your writing just how you know great financial independence is not only for you and your wife but for for your son yeah it's really it, it really changes the parenting experience, which is a little hard to express to people who don't have kids yet. But kids are such a huge like uh, commitment, you know, and like they take so much time and they keep you up at night when they're babies. And you know, the more time you have for your kid, the better. And especially if you're one of those types of people that really wants to do a good job at whatever you do, like say you're a dedicated career person, and then you have a kid or two you're going to be comparatively quite crappy at your job because like all of a sudden you have to miss sick days and you're always taking calls from home or you know you don't feel like you can work late because there's people waiting for you at home so your mind is divided so yeah. i really like the idea of if you are lucky enough to get started early at thinking about this plan like when you're 20 to 23 or whatever you know get your money earning and your career kick assing done in advance so you, while you have time to focus on it and then when you have the kids, you have time to focus on them. And it's okay if you suck at your job or preferably you don't even have a full-time job during your kid-raising years because, um, you know, just one thing at a time. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, uh, it's, it seems definitely like the best way to go. Um, so you mentioned five years ago, you know, you, or sorry, five years before you actually became financially independent, you actually started seeing your savings grow and thought, hey, I need to actually invest this and, in, you know, help it grow more. So you mentioned that you uh, read a few books. Do you have any that you would recommend to the to other people that are, you know, in the same shoes you are uh, at that stage? Yeah, well, investing is pretty simple, at least if you do the, the stodgy old man way, which is basically just you don't buy Apple stock, you don't buy Facebook stock, you just buy big index funds from the Vanguard company where you get huge basically you're just buying a huge slice of the US economy and then you buy another huge slice of of the European economy and so you you're not trying to predict ups and downs you're just throwing all your money in there and it it just grows by itself it's very stable you get dividends from it and the funny part about that style of investing is it's the easiest kind but yet you know from an academic perspective people who do studies on this they prove that it's also the most efficient kind in terms of um risk versus reward ratio and stuff so um yeah yeah it really does work great and vanguard is a is in my opinion one of the best companies to do that because their fees are the lowest so you really just you know it works into it ends up being hundreds of thousands of dollars that you save over a lifetime in investment management fees which is pretty significant and, and it makes it really simple and so one book that would talk about that that talks about that in nice all in one is um there's one called The Four Pillars of Investing by William Bernstein, I think, is the author. That's pretty good. You know, you can go from beginner to everything you need in one book. And another one that's kind of cool is called A Random Walk Down Wall Street by, I forget, is it the same author or another one? Anyway, that's a, it's a pretty famous book. And it, teach, it basically will teach you to fear um, crazy active investing, which you should fear. You should be afraid to buy Facebook stock on its IPO day. And you should be afraid to try to time the market. That's the kind of stuff that you want to beat out of your natural personality if you want to become a long-term wealthy investor. Excellent. So, you know, five years you're starting to, you know, invest in in index funds and it's really starting to grow then. Um, 
Can you describe, you know, that day that you actually realized you're going to be able to stop working and quit your job? And I, I guess you said that you and your wife were both on this path together. So was that a joint decision or did one of you uh, work longer than the other? Or? Yeah, the having the wife on board thing was really great. So I think it was, if, if you want to put a chronology to it, it's uh, the guy and the girl decide that they want to have kids and then they kind of decide to get more serious about their savings. And then we both, I think we would just each made our own spreadsheet of how much we'd saved up, you know, and how things are doing. And at, maybe after each paycheck or every couple of paychecks, we would update our stuff and get the latest stock prices and stock amounts and dividends and add it all in. So, so we were excited because we would see this forward progress. And then, uh, and then we kind of, then we started tracking our spending a little bit. And we figured, okay, at that time we were spending a lot because we were traveling a lot and and we still had a mortgage and everything too. So I think we were spending about $40,000 a year just between the two of us with no kid. So the idea was get enough money saved up so that the passive income could equal this $40,000 we need. So gradually that formed into a rough guess of how much we needed to save. And so then we just started working towards that number of savings and then got closer and closer. And then as we, there was like various hiccups along the way and changes. But eventually once we got to the number safely, then we just felt, oh, it's fine to quit the job. So mm-hmm. so we did. I quit mine and she quit hers. And then, then she moved into, uh, my wife moved into kind of a part-time casual job for a while. And then I have done a bunch of stuff since then. So I've done various kinds of work and non-work you know, and the parenting part has really cut down our ability to work. So we're really unproductive individuals now compared to when we were in our 20s. So right. we're, we're just being conscious and saying, yeah, that's that's just part of being a parent. You're not going to kick ass at anything in particular. It's okay if I can't answer all my Mr. Money Mustache emails or do the best blog posts, you know, that I would if I had eight hours a day free. And then later on, kids grow up and then, you know, there's a chance you might you might get more hardcore about something in the future. All right. Did uh, did your employer know what you guys were up to, or did you just you know quit, or did they actually know that you were retiring? And if so, what what was their reaction like? Yeah, they they, they did because I was pretty close with my coworkers at the high tech company, so uh, I kind of told them over the final year. I, I just got more and more. It's almost like a religion, financial independence, because you're like, what? You start to wonder and wonder out loud, why did that guy just buy a BMW when he doesn't even have his house paid off or and stuff like that? And, you know, and we talk about various, uh, you know, financial crazinesses in the world. And then that leads to talk about how you would eventually want to stop working. So, you know, when I when I did stop working, by that time, my coworkers had figured out that I was planning to to not get another job. And uh, yeah, most of them thought it was pretty cool, actually. And there were a couple of people that are were far ahead of me, <clears throat> but they just were enough tuned into work that they didn't want to quit, even though they, they could easily afford to. So those guys and girls were, you know, they were just pretty supportive, not skeptical at all, because they're like, yeah, that's what I've been in situation for the last 10 years, but uh, I just work because I like engineering or something. Wow. Did did you did uh, any of your colleagues like you know see the light and say wow I, you know I should be doing this? Did any of them like drastically change and say you know s- start on that path to you know meet you in retirement in a few years or? Yeah, well there were a couple people. You know, there's there's people. It's like a spectrum of people, right? Consumerism spectrum disorder, you could call it. So there's some people who uh, were sort of like you, the mad scientist, who had the tendency of this, and then they got tendency to want to be financial independent so once you realize it's possible and someone tells you then you start to go more and more that way and then on the other side there were people who were the extreme spenders who just always insist that it's impossible so those people still work there today or at another company (laughs) whereas some other people i know have actually gone into kind of early retirement since in the uh six years or seven years since i quit there so it's kind of neat I don't know if I influenced them all that much. Um, some of them are actually um, Mr. Winnie Mustache readers. so <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Those ones uh, maybe are getting more influenced. <laughs> nice. Um, you mentioned that uh, 
you know, you were planning to have your passive income, you know, be able to sustain you. Um, how, how did you generate the passive income? Did, did, was that from like dividends on your investments alone or did you, did you, uh, you know, start any passive income businesses or? Um, yeah, that's, that's still changing over time. So during the saving years, my plan was that it was just going to be stocks. I didn't really know much about dividends at the time. I just knew that stocks go up and they give you a bit of dividends. So you, you get dividend checks and then you also sell a tiny bit of your shares each year and you can live off them. But then when I, um, right after I, you know, right before I quit that job, we moved to a different town, a nearby town, and I kept the old house and rented it out. And at that time, interest rates were going down a lot too. You know, my first mortgage was 7.8% interest rate, wow. which people thought was good at the time. <laughs> and then that dropped and dropped and dropped. So then I, at one point I had refinanced it down to the fours or something. So all of a sudden the mortgage payment was lower, but my neighborhood was doing great because it's right next to Boulder, Colorado. So I was able to rent out that house a lot for, for a great high rate. So then the rent from that house was paying for itself and for our new house's mortgage. So then I, I basically had stumbled into the magic of um, real estate and landlording, which you know everybody's known, a lot of people have known about that for many generations, but for me it was new. So I thought, wow, you know, like this house is working for me and doing a lot more work, even though it, it takes almost no work to manage it. So then I got a bit more interested in, in uh, owning rental houses. And so now my biggest source of passive income is another rental house that I have in this town, um, the city I live in right now. And overall, if, for people who are interested in stuff like that, like interested in houses and real estate, that's a source of passive income that's much better than stocks and dividends, if you know what you're doing, because the rate of return is much higher. You know, like in stocks, if you buy a dividend fund at Vanguard, you get 3 to 4% per year. Um, you can buy real estate investment trusts through the stock market that pay 6 to 8%, which is fairly good. So $100,000 invested will give you 6000 to 8000 a year. But a rental house or like a small apartment building or a cup, you know, a duplex or whatever, it's not unheard of for those things to give you 10% of their value even after paying for all their expenses per year. So in that sense, you could just have like say three rental houses worth $100,000 each and then you could have 30000 of income from them. And uh, there's all kinds of people like, you know, people who comment on the Mr. Money Mustache forum who are really crazy into this, people with dozens of properties or somewhere between three and 30. And even if they borrow money to buy these things on 30-year mortgages, these guys have become financially independent with hardly even any of their own capitals. You know, they just have like this flock of well-chosen rental houses. Um, mortgages are paying themselves. They had to put small down payments on, but not a huge amount. So there's all kinds of fancy ways um, to get a living without without even having to resort to stocks. It just depends on how conservative you are. Um, stocks are the most conservative and safe. Real estate takes a bit more knowledge and and skill and you know there is a risk because if you don't know what you're doing you can end up getting uh underwater properties with loans like everybody did in 2008 sure now now reading the mr money mustache site uh often i i know that you're uh, you're you're very handy and you know you're you have many skills that would be good for fixing up houses and things like that do you think that's essential in you know getting in into that rental uh investing um or it, it obviously can't hurt, but do you think it's it's something that's essential, or could somebody with you know minimal skills develop them as they as they go along with you know their first rental property? Yeah, it's definitely not essential because it just depends on your personality type. If you like managing people, or you know making phone calls, you can have you can hire contractors and handymen to take care of your properties, and you never have to lift a screwdriver at all. Um, I personally am the opposite kind of personality where I really don't like having to call people and deal with people screwing up and everything. I just love doing stuff myself. So for my personality, I, I would only be a happy landlord if I was able to take care of minor or major stuff myself. It all depends. But yeah, there's definitely some super successful property owners who are not carpenters at all. Um, it's just my own my idea of fun is building stuff. So even now in, in retirement, I just I mean I do a lot of 
building stuff. It's just kind of, you know, time flies by when I do that and I have a great time. So I'm never going to stop that. Nice. And by mixing it in with property ownership, it, it, it makes even more of a game of it because I like, you know, on the blog, we documented a thing where we bought a really junky house in my neighborhood that was unlivable and then fixed it up over a couple month period to be somewhat stylish and then uh, rented it out for a pretty good rate. So by buying it so cheap from this bank, you know, it was like a foreclosure situation and then fixing it up. It was like a great, you know, you get this great combination of artistic design and carpentry work and then a little bit of business work, you know, of renting it out. And then, then it turns into a source of passive income, which is paying 10% per year or whatever. So yeah, that's, that's amazing. And yeah, it, it sounds like you, you're, you have the ability to continue to make more and more money even as after you retire. So people will probably, you know, get scared that, oh no, I'll, I'll quit my job. And then this, this chunk in the bank has to sustain me until I die. But reading, reading your blog and seeing all the all the great things you're doing after retirement, it, uh, it just makes you think that, you know, you could, there's even more income out there that than you could probably even expected when you uh, first quit your job. Yeah, that's the cool part is your a blo- uh, job is kind of a bit of a soul-sucking enterprise, and it, especially if it's not the perfect job for you. So all of your creative energy goes into that. So once you quit it, what I find anyway, and a couple other people who are in the same situation, their, your creative energy and your your skills kind of come out of the woodwork and then all of a sudden you find yourself doing stuff that you didn't have time to do before and then you know it takes on a life of its own because you're not too worried about the money and then you know you end up with neat new careers you never would have thought of and just uh, since you and I are both writing blogs now that's that's an example in itself like I never thought I would be a writer of any sort. I mean, I enjoyed writing and reading and blah, blah, blah. But all of a sudden, this thing has become super addictive and I love writing. And now my blog is uh, is maybe even a bigger job than than the carpentry was because it's kind of taken off in, in a sense. And, and in fact, even the, the blog even started making money, uh, which I never expected. So um, yeah, so a bunch of unexpected and fun stuff happens when you stop working for a living. That's, that's the real key. It makes your life a lot more of an adventure, which I like. Yeah, it sounds amazing. And um, what do you th- what do you think is that is that one of the best things about being financially independent, or what do you think the best part is? Yeah, it's hard to pick one best part, but I mean, the idea of freedom is great, and the idea of weekdays becoming your weekends is really neat. Like, I still get a bit of a thrill every Monday morning, and I wake up and I'm like, yes, it's not a work day today, <laughs> and then it feels like, you know, like just the idea of an unlimited weekend is really, really magical, probably because I worked, you know, I worked really hard during my days. I was a bit of a workaholic, and and in school, I was a bit of a schoolaholic where I always thought you had to get these super good marks. So I was probably, like, I was probably torturing myself unnecessarily during those years, and I could have, if I could go back in time, I would teach myself to relax then. But now, you know, with with the actual lack of a real job, then the relaxation comes automatically. So you get this nice thrill of like, I don't have to do anything, but I just want to do stuff. So it's just a really nice feeling every morning when you wake up and there's the sun and there's more stuff you can do awesome. and your days aren't really planned out and stuff like that. Oh man, that sounds great. Um, were there any uh, tools or spreadsheets that you used that were particularly helpful as you were on your journey towards financial independence? Yeah. Yeah. I heard that the mad scientist is into spreadsheets and I definitely advocate that for people who are saving, but I don't have, um, it's been so long since I used my own spreadsheets that I don't have a good one to share. So on the, on the blog, we've, we've had a, a series of them on the Mr. Money Mustache blog, and the, the most recent one, uh, especially for U.S.-based people, is there's a thing called the Ultimate Retirement Calculator, and the people who made it uh, put it on their own website after giving it to me. It's called lifespreadsheet.com. And that thing is a great place for tracking your own earnings and savings and stuff. It's a pretty fun spreadsheet. Um, personally, what I use right now is just the Mint, um, you know, that, uh, that sure. financial service thing that's free. I just use that as a net worth tracker of where you have, uh, it just sucks the information out of your bank accounts and your investment accounts to keep track of how things are going. And, and the spending tracking is the part I find most useful. I'm not super 
interested in net worth anymore, but I do find it interesting to see how much I spent each month. And then if it looks like more, you just click on a little part of the pie, the pie chart and it zooms in and it's like entertainment, $500. And you zoom in on that and you're like, oh yeah, this is the month that I bought like the, you know, the whole bunch of stuff for a party or something like that. So, cool. Yeah. Um, no, mint, so yeah mint, I, I also use mint. That's an excellent, excellent tool. And yeah. So mint is great for tracking spreadsheets are maybe better for predicting so making your own predictions of uh you know i've been saving say like ten thousand dollars a year for a certain amount of time but it's been going up and and then my investments are probably going to go up by a certain amount so making your own spreadsheet is a great idea for you know for when you're in the early saving years and you want to get some kind of estimates and also the spreadsheet that i mentioned ultimate retirement calculator on life spreadsheet Dot com also I think has some pretty good prediction stuff. Excellent. Perfect. Yeah, I'll put a I'll put a link to that on the show notes. Um yeah. right, any uh any final advice you'd give to anybody out there? What's uh if there's one thing maybe that you wish you had done, you know, five years earlier and you could have been, you know, retired before you were thirty, uh is there any <laughs> final advice that one piece of advice you would give anybody out there that's uh, you know, starting on this path? Um, I think the the thing that I would tell other people, I kind of like, I just mostly got lucky. So I, I mean, lucky in the sense that I did things that ended up being the right thing to do, you know, looking back. But for other people, what I would suggest is make sure you're thinking about your spending even more than your income. And, uh, you know, by understanding what the, what happiness means and helping to de- decouple the idea of happiness from owning certain things you can really amaze yourself at how fun your life can be because really this, the whole secret to uh, living a rich life is not feeling like you need more than you already have. Um, otherwise, you're going to just be always craving more and more and more until you get to the Gulfstream G650 jet and then you'll be like, okay, now I have everything, but I'm still not happy, crap. And, cause, right. and that's because the happiness does not get increased by buying stuff so learn about happiness read books about happiness that's number one advice because that'll help you spend a lot less because all of a sudden it'll just kill so many of your material desires and then you'll be so much happier and really this whole thing about retirement and early retirement and financial independence it's it's really a quest for happiness so study that independently of the money and then that makes the money part easier and then the Simpler, another tactic that's a little bit less deep is just um, my golden rule is that everybody has to ride a bike, and which is almost a little bit related to the happiness thing because, like, a bike is like this distilled essence of life where you know you get where you want to go, you get fitness, you get socialization, nature, you get badassity in the sense that you get tougher and you're forced to deal with nature. And it's like the bike is like a microcosm of of leading a good life and it also saves you a ton of money so basically if you lead a life and you're an able-bodied person and and you're not riding a bike there's something wrong in your life and you got to fix that and you know that's kind of like it's funny because it sounds so shallow but it's actually pretty deep it's basically if you can if you can get to enjoy leading riding a bike all the time then you're probably on the right path to leading a happy and financially independent life well, that's great. Thanks a lot, Mr. Money Mustache. That's It's been an awesome uh, interview, and I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, anybody out there that wants to learn more, then uh, go to mrmoneymustache.com. Is there any anywhere else uh, they can email you from there if they wanted to get in touch? Yeah, everything you need is there on the site. And, uh, yeah, hope to see some of your readers hanging out there. And I'll be checking out Mad Scientist as the site grows, too. Excellent. Thanks again. All right. Bye-bye. Well, that's the end of the first Mad Scientist Financial Independence podcast. I hope you enjoyed the discussion with Mr. Money Mustache as much as I did. If you've not checked out his site yet, uh, you should really head over there now and take a look. Uh, He recently launched a forum that is very active with great discussions about all things related to financial independence, and all the articles he writes are top-notch, so you should definitely check it out. And that's it for now, so thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time. E equals MC. Finance.